Welcome back to this week's episode of RX Radio, where we look to get old people out of fitness podcasting. Join the movement to destroy the boomers before they destroy the world. You can't afford a house. It's because they're talking about Zone 2 Cardio. Welcome to RX Radio. I am one of your hosts, Jordan Schell. Uh Joking, but actually not at all. Um, we should do that, and we're gonna we're gonna do it. So if you don't like old people ruining the only thing we have left, which is fitness, um, then you know subscribe on Spotify or on YouTube. Yes, we're on YouTube. You can see the evolution of the studio setup over the years. Uh, today's episode. You think I was cynical? Killian Hamilton on the feature co-host um uh, we just get really angry about the idea of athlete training uh you know the athleticism uh, athlete training and training like an athlete has been a, a you know a very emergent theme of people who weren't good at powerlifting, uh people who want to get into olympic weightlifting but suck uh people who want to get into running because they give up um and they try and train all their clients like that and not really understanding what it takes or what it means to train like an athlete because they've never actually been within 100 feet of a real athlete. Um, and of course, we're talking about old people and uh, their fitness podcasts and their zone two and their goddamn rock marches with their goddamn weighted vest. Um, we're going to talk about none of those things. and We're going to talk about useful uh, tools and understanding how do we differentiate athletic movements in the gym, how do we better prepare for improving athleticism? What is athleticism? Um, and what are different some different criteria we can use, or different criteria we can use to help parse out the week from the chaff? Um, so, fun episode. Always good to kick the tires with Killian. Has some super interesting uh, theories and ideas when it comes to resistance training, especially on the uh, athlete side of things when it comes to sprinting and plyometrics and body weight exercises and calisthenics. So we go into all that. Um, but before I leave you and Lundy does our intro, uh, just remember that boomers are a plague. And if you don't believe me, look on the top fitness charts in uh, Spotify and Apple and just look at the fitness podcast. We've turned the keys over to the parents and it's time to get them out of the house and throw a cool little party where everyone's jacked in and shape and not uh, fasting for 85 hours and recording it on the internet and talking about the latest research study without ever after doing anything. Uh, so this is the antidote to the pipe cleaner arm old people brigade. Join us. Uh, spread the word. Um, we're just going to turn into a cult at a certain point. And it, please, please don't harm. No old people were harmed in the making of this podcast. Just ignore them. Just don't listen to them anymore. Don't give them a voice. They've said too much and they've ruined everything. Let them go off into Facebook where they belong, where old people's voices on the Internet should go to die. Uh, probably the cheeriest intro we've had in a while. So guys, hope you enjoy the episode. Uh, all seriousness, a lot of good takeaways when it comes to training athletes, relative body weight, I think is going to be a, a takeaway or relative strength to body weight ratios. I think it's going to be a big takeaway for anyone who uh, you know uses body weight exercises or even understanding strength training. I definitely put it understanding relative strength as we talk about in the show is on the Mount Rushmore of things that I think all trainers should know intimately and be able to conceptualize and see it when it's in front of them. But anyways, no further ado, Killian Hamilton, RX Radio, uh, you know, Death to Boomer Fitness Podcast. Lundy, hit it. You're tuned in to RX Radio. Really, the elixir to the podcast is, is angst. It's, it's my lifeblood, that and coffee. Yeah, it's you what know, I I'd, need. I'd say. I'd say welcome back, but I actually think you're, 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 Killian Hamilton has been part of the intro now for like, I don't know, a year and a half? I think so. So I don't know if you're a guest or a co-host. I had this problem the other day. Yeah, I don't know. Because for a while it was me and Jay and right. you weren't here. So was I a co-host or was I a guest? I think you'd be Not a co-host. Not you and I think at a certain point, one of us is Kevin Eubanks and you're Jay Leno. I think that's how this shapes yeah. out. I think I'm it's just like going to play guitar riffs in between. It's like Lost uh, It's like lost Highway when uh, Bill Pullman calls himself at home and he's already there. Uh, right. For those of us who don't have a Wikipedia-esque knowledge of obscure movies, what the fuck are you talking about? Oh, David, uh, David Lynch. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. 
I'm gonna need some more. It's we're we're either going all in on this or we're just gonna fucking toss it in the rear view. We should probably pull the parachute. I was worried when you said welcome back though, because I'm wearing a shirt that says prison on it, and I, I feared people mm. thought this was welcoming me back from Stanford County Prison. I think the haircut is probably the number one concern for those of us watching at home on YouTube. Because you didn't preface the haircut at any point. We just got on a call a couple weeks ago and you're like, This is this is it. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, it's Derek Vineyard esque. The Sambas aren't doing you any favors. It's very no. oi, if I may, if I may there use that go. and I oi, believe in a proper yeah, context. I got a bomber jacket if you want to go cause some mischief. There we'll, you go. we'll just go, we'll call Chubbs up. It'll be a time. Uh, so I think it's the hair, because the thing is, I had this have happened and I feel like there should be a service shy of just sending people. A picture of your face to let them know there's been some changes in the life of Killian Hamilton. Yeah. Example, I was in my practice. So early in my career, I, I had an office at Boss Barbell Club in Mountain View, California. Owner, if some of you might be familiar with the powerlifting space, Dan Green, competitive powerlifter, Dan Green powerlifter on Instagram, Dan Green, world record holder, 220s and 242 weight class, Dan Green, really long hair, Dan Green tries to kill himself with barbells. Uh, and one day, Dan walked into the gym and like, same thing, no warning about, hey, I've made a major decision in my life to change my outward visual appearance. Um, and he showed up with cornrows. Yeah. And I was with a patient in my office and I like an, an unmistakable human being from a sheer size. So it's not like, oh, that guy looks like Dan with cornrows. It's like, holy fuck, Dan went Britney in 07 cornrows and i literally said excuse me one second and i left my office and i walked outside and i tapped him on the shoulder and he turned around and his like braids beads or whatever like kind of like made some noise as they hit together and i was like are you okay and he just looked at me like fucking malibu's most wanted he goes yeah what i was like what do you mean what dude you're like 33 year old man who just walked into the gym one day with cornrows insane there's got to be a service like a I don't know, a notification, like a, like an Amber alert. Yeah. Cause I think, I think shaving my head, like I did, and this is grown out, like this is long in comparison yeah. to what it was when you first saw it. Uh, it's not something you, you plan, you know, it's not like I'm making an appointment to shave my head today. It's kind of, you go in to get a haircut and I got it from our friend Mousetrap and uh, I just didn't want hair in it. It was too hot. And now you're back in Toronto. And now it's too cold. And living with the consequence of your decisions. Shout out Mousetrap. There um, you go. Same. I did my, I was going to do the dome tattoo early, late last year and I shaved it down to the wood and then uh, a snowstorm hit and Brett, Brett Moss couldn't make it into the studio and I had to get to the thing. So I was like, wow, I'm just going to be this guy for like a couple of months. And uh, yeah, doesn't, doesn't normalize no. well. Although a friend of the show, John Hollier, host of the All on Black podcast, which I de definitely recommend if those of you want to uh, absolutely insane stories from almost the crypt, uh, I would go listen to that. That's a famous John Hollier story. John Hollier used to have really long hair. And then yeah. for reasons unknown, he decided to cut it down very short. Now, John Hollier is not known as a long hair guy. And that took me by surprise. That was very startling to go from long hair John to, to no hair John. That was something I, mm. I had never been used to. And I think this is a good segue today because you know who else has crazy haircuts? Athletes. And that's going to be what we talk about today. Uh, a timeless RX radio segue. Some uh, favorite athlete haircuts. The hair dye is, I think, is a lazy route to go. I it's think fair. that's like, uh, you haven't really put much thought into this. Um, I do like David Noku and Xavier McKinney got like the braids, half blonde, half like, I, I, I wish there was a universe that existed that I could rock that. I also wish there was a universe where I played for the New York giants, um, to which yeah, probably the same universe. Um, but as far as great athlete haircuts go, um, I feel like athletics really brought the mullet in and out of circulation, like athletes. Athletes haircuts are probably the most influential in the haircut market. Like I'm sure if you're a barber, what do you want today, sir? Give me the blank. Give me the messy 
give me the thing, right? Give me the, I don't know. I don't think LeBron James has a necessarily a nice haircut, but you know, they're, they're people of, they're people of influence, these athletes. And so much so yeah. that over the course of, I don't know, I would say CrossFit was probably the rise of the athletic training and not athletic training as a subdiscipline of some sort of manual medicine or rehabilitation, but training like an athlete probably got its embers stoked in the early CrossFit days. So you're looking what, 2008, 2009, that was when it was kind of a ground, uh, a ground movement coming out of California and then probably hit its peak in 2014, 15 era. But from kind of the, the simmering of the CrossFit and a, as a mainstay in the fitness industry, emerging now out of that is this idea of training like an athlete. And, you know, we see it in many different forms. You know, we were talking about uh, berries and passing earlier. You, know, you see things like F45 and these different things. What is, the, what is the draw? What's the deal? Why do we like this? You know, I have many, you know, both jaded and non-jaded opinions on it. But I think the initial draw in tra training like an athlete is because we see athletes, a lot of people, as role models. They do something that we can comprehend, but we can't comprehend ourselves doing it. So if we can, if we can try to own a piece of what that person does, I think it elevates us in a large way in our confidence to just feeling that much more capable. Than, than we might be if we just went to the gym. You know, I think also, you know, people like training ath like an athlete because, you know, for a long time, we've kind of had this connotation of lifting weights is like meathead. There's a meathead aesthetic. There's a meathead culture around just lifting weight. I don't just lift weights in the gym. You know, I train like an athlete. So I think, it, you know, in some ways it, it serves to make people, you know, elevate themselves uh, almost onto this, you know, soapbox in a way. Yeah, it's also interesting because it does change the goalpost, right? Like where, if you don't go in with the uh, distinct purpose of lifting like an athlete, it's probably a default understanding that your goal is something aesthetic, fat loss or muscle gain or something along those lines or some bullshit uh, colloquial term that pretty much, you know, tone or whatever. It's like, okay, it's, yeah. it's, it's you mean you a little bit of muscle, a little less fat. And so it does move the goalpost in an interesting way. And it, in some ways, it makes the athlete um, more relatable, right? The bodybuilder is not relatable because the, the, what it takes to, you know, attain a physique like that is so unbelievably difficult, right? And the thing with athletes that I think makes them even more relatable is their performance in the, for the most part, I would say at large, in the gym as so far as they train, you know, the adaptable qualities that we sort of being and categorized as athleticism, they sometimes are not that great at it. I'm just saying, like, there are some guys that are freaks with great verticals and long broad jumps and, you know, fast 40s and, you know, great conditioning. But, like, you know, if you are, a, like, let's say your core sport is baseball. And, you know, 15, even now, today, like, there are baseball players who, by their physicality, and this is more true as you move towards skill-based sports. And I would say baseball is probably the highest skilled sport sure. um, you know, outside of something like golf, which we don't usually attribute athleticism to in a, in a conventional way. It's like, okay, you're a lot closer than you think, right? Where it's like you're really far from the Mr. Olympia stage. You know that. Objectively, you're X number of pounds and you're X percent body fat. Your arms are you know X inches. It's very objectifiable, like, well, this guy's quads are 30 inches and arms are 20 inches and calves are 20 inches and he's 4% body fat. And he's 260 pounds. But, like, as long as CC Sabathia in his prime, who was, if you don't know, C baseball, and I was talking to our friend Kyle Rogers the other day, who's a pitching coordinator for the New York Mets, prescript coach, great dude. I know you've done a lot of work in going back and forth with Rogers in the baseball players that you've consulted with over the year. Baseball is interesting because it's the one sport where people get in better shape after they're done playing. 100%. Mental. So you take CC Sabathia in his prime and you go, okay, as long as I'm not throwing off a mound and I'm comparing my training to CC Sabathia in the gym and say CC does a box jump, the box is probably going to be at a height that's really attainable for you and at a, like a rep and set scheme that's probably one-to-one -one with CC Sabathia. There's more than a few differences genetically between you two. And I wouldn't think that box jump equals, you know, a hundred straight down the pipe on the mound. But 
in this a train like an athlete thing, other than like a few orders of magnitude in your annual salary, you can be a much closer to the goal or the, the goal post at the very least. Yeah, and, and I think you make a good point too. In, in in large part, the idea that, you know, I think up until very, very recently, time is whatever relative to things, but recently in our industry, we haven't had a good description of what training like an athlete is. Even you and I are going to try to probably do it today, but a lot of people will struggle if you were to ask them, you know, like, okay, you train like an athlete, can you describe what it is? It's really indescribable for a lot of people or hard to describe. And because of that, there's no objective way that no, to know that anyone's good or bad at that style of training. Like if you go, oh, you do powerlifting, how much do you bench? And this guy's like, I benched 245. You're like, all right, well, you suck. You're not good at it. Bye. Or it's like, yeah, like you said, you can't be a Mr. Olympia not shredded in 300 pounds. It's very obvious to be able from the outside in to, to see someone not being successful at it or that person to feel they're not successful at it. Where I think there is a level of safety in people to say, well, I train like an athlete. So my absolute strength isn't as high as some people, but that's because that's not my total goal. You know, I bench press to train like an athlete. I don't bench press to be a power lifter. And you always hear these comparisons made even by bodybuilders, right? It's like, well, I only squat 405. I'm not interested in being strong. I'm just interested in the, in the aesthetics. Like being strong never led to having huge wheels or something weird. But I think part of it too in this day and age is, you know, there's a risk versus reward, which I think you and I always reference. And there's a safety in saying you train like an athlete because it's really hard for someone to figure out if you're good at it or not. Yeah. I mean, we talk in the L1 when we talk about like the importance of an intake form and working with a new client. And one of the things we talk about, we talk about lifting, we talk about lifestyle, uh, we talk about injury history, but we also talk about goals. And it's not some like drawn out uh, motivational bullshit about goal setting. It's like really practical. Like, look, wh what is a goal? It's like a goal. A goal is more or less, if you kind of invert it, is clearly outlining the parameters of failure. It's like, yeah. okay, what are the guardrails that you're going to run into when you haven't reached the goal? Because that's the most important thing. Because if you clearly don't know what those guardrails are, because you probably uh, haven't run into them yet. And you don't really know. Otherwise, you'd be at your goal. You'd have wrought you'd have arrived at the goal. So, you know, it clearly outlines the definition of failure. So I think part of the emergence of at least a language of training like an athlete, and there's training like an athlete, and there's training an athlete, which are two, two separate things. Like part of the, the emergence and popularity, I think is the, the relatability, right? The more transparency we have into the, like the lives of pro athletes and we see them in the gym and we realize that, oh, they actually struggle with some of the execution things and they struggle with some comprehension. And sometimes they do, well, they miscount on reps too. So we're getting a, 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 a higher resolution image of what an athlete in a gym looks like. Now, night and day, right? I mean, there's a kid I worked with uh, three years ago who's, um, he's a safety for the Green Bay Packers. His name is Eric Stokes. He was a, out of Georgia. He's a track and field athlete and obviously a college football player. When lunging, he could not coordinate his upper and lower body. He would walk like he would lunge like Frankenstein. He would lunge left arm forward with left foot. It was like watching the Michael Jackson Thriller music video. And like, what the fuck is going on? So you'd look at this guy as a general fitness enthusiast or gym goer and you'd be like, this guy ran a, I don't know, I think he ran a 10-4 or 10-500 meter on two torn hamstrings and then ran a 4-2-3-40 uh, like three months later at the combine. Like at 198 pounds, six foot three, one of like probably the largest to ever run a sub 4-3. And but you watch him lunge and you're like, oh, he's just like me. It's like, yeah, except for one thing. When this guy hits max velocity, you can't even see him. But yeah, other than that, with the box jumping shit and the lunging, he's just like you. But so I think the relatability is one, which is a huge takeaway. And it's a huge takeaway whether you train bodybuilders. It's a huge takeaway if you train general population clients. Relatability becomes a cornerstone to a fitness business, period, regardless of what your niche is. That that I think is big. And as people try and become more, you know, whether it's academically superlative, whether it's physically superlative, your relatability actually starts to shrink. And if you look at people making the most amount of money in this industry, it's YouTube kids that are hyper relatable, right? Which usually means they're not in that great of shape, right? But they're likable and they kind of have a transparency about the struggles they have in the gym. So I think that's thing number one. Thing number two is, yeah, like you said, the ambiguity of the goal right? All you really need to do is have neon shoes that match the shorts you're wearing over your Under Armour pants. And you're kind of like halfway there, 
right? And then you can justify, maybe you wear some wide receiver gloves for no reason when you're doing a drill inside of a gym in, inside of Toronto. But like, so I think there's good and bad takeaways. I mean, I think there are takeaways that we can look at and cross apply to training principles in general. One, I think being relatability is big. But I think when we get down to it, when the thing we all unanimously understand about athletic training is probably a few things. I, I would say my first out of the jump, uh, and no pun intended, would probably be something that includes uh, different planes of motion that we train. And I think that's that at, at large, if you were to, without people really understanding what change of motion or cha- planes of direction are, frontal, sagittal, transverse plane, I think they would know it if they saw it, right? And they definitely know when it's not present. Right. So if you could put like a power lifter next to someone who's training like an athlete, squatting could be a part of it, but you're probably going to see someone enter into a, ch- a change of direction or an exercise that exists outside of just front to back sagittal plane flexion extension. So I think that's criteria number one. If we were to like, let's try and define what it means to train as an athlete. As a general heuristic, I think most people are going to go, well, we need, we need exercises that exist and are loaded in some way within the different planes of motion. So something that's front to back, something that's side to side, and something that's more rotational. Rotational being the one that we probably see the least in conventional resistance training, but probably going to see increasingly more so as people get into whatever training like an athlete is. So that, that's like the first that comes to mind for me is uh, the planes of motion. Yeah, I think the first thing there, the, you know, outside of planes of motion, I think the one underlooked thing that comes to my mind more now as it, you know, I would say I train like an athlete, ironically to this more so, but it's rhythm, like rhythm and cadence. I think that's something we see in all athletics is all athletics have to some degree a low lying necessity for rhythm. You know, basketball has a rhythm. When you see someone dribble a ball, there's an inherent rhythm to that. A long jumper has a rhythm. A hockey player has, you played hockey for a long time. There's a rhythm and cadence to stride length and contact and the way you take a corner going in versus coming out of a corner, the way you'd cross a blue line, like there's an inherent rhythm to, you know, even skating itself. And in baseball, there's going to be to some level of rhythm to both batting and to throwing. So I think, you know, something that I consider more than now or more often uh, than not now is the rhythm. So like moving outside of planes and then, you know, is there a rhythmic component to what I do in a session? To quote one of the greatest athletes of all time, feel the rhythm, feel the rhyme. Get on up. It's Bob, Bob Sled Time. Yes, of course. Uh, It's probably one of the most dynamic athletes. Really, really a triple threat there, Sanka in the back with his lucky egg. If you don't know Cool Runnings, just turn off the pod now. Go do yourself a favor. Homework. Mandatory reading here at RX Radio. I think we could look at a general pool of exercises, and this is where I think the compli- this is where the conversation I think can get a little bit nuanced. That most people would agree are athletic in the way we categorize them, and I think um, I think there'd be generally some some flaws in throwing these exercises in, especially when we get to general population. So, like you know, anything jumping and landing, anything change of direction, anything where rhythm timing. And velocity to a certain degree, like true velocity, not like my tendo unit on my deadlift, the fishing line attached to my yo-yo said I moved a bar. That, like that's not velocity, dude. Like that's it's, it's it's a it's a reading of something, but speed ultimately has to be fast, which is like kind of in some ways it's a useless trope and useless totality, but in other ways it's actually the most meaningful thing when it comes to driving a a specific adaptation. It's like speed has to be fast. Right, yeah. like speed slow is not speed, right? So if seven point six meters per second on a deadlift is like uh, okay, whatever, that's you know at max velocity, Usain Bolt is running seventeen meters per second, maybe hits the 70, 70 meter mark. That's probably how fast he's going. So it's like these things are dependent because we look at a lot of athletic movements; they're usually not constrained necessarily by barbell or dumbbell. They're usually multi joint, potentially multi planar. There might even be a reactive component to it where it requires a change of direction, right? That amortization phase of like, okay, we're slowing down, stopping, and then speeding up and accelerating, right? So we're, we're this change of direction absorbs in production and transferring of force. And then there's usually a, there's usually a component of body weight, right? Yourself becomes the machine. And this is where I think a lot of trainers are set to really pay attention to 
the, how they categorize exercises because it is such a drastic variable from individual to individual and can carry with it much different adaptations, whether it be you know adaptations maybe at a bony level, right? Adaptations at a tissue or tendon level, adaptations at a muscular level. Right. So this is where, you know, I think we would all if we were all to come together and do a whiteboard session, everyone who listens to this podcast would be like, I think these movements are athletic. And we weren't trying to be like some know it all outlier, like, you know, bench press. We talking to Kyle Rogers the other week. One of the highest correlations to like max velocity in pitching is like bench press. Like, go, go figure. Not the most functional thing in the world, the way shoulder mechanics. But, hey, guys that are fucking ripping 100 probably have a stronger upper body if for no other reason that strength is an indication of durability which is yeah. but if we were just to be like hey let's let's just be very generic in the way people think about athletic training we'd probably come up with a list of body weight exercises that probably have you know a, a change of direction compound move compound in nature and probably again just don't have the constraint of a machine the variable of body weight is huge that's the pin that goes into the plate loaded machine and it's a really different adaptation when people start playing with different pins. And so you'll see clients or trainers in gyms where the, this is sort of their bag and they like training people like athletes. The, the different, the same exercise performed by someone with a different relative strength to, weight, strength to body weight ratio is a different exercise. Yeah. yeah so if I you think, look at the, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and I, I think that's something that gets massively overlooked in the like, you know, the target the target fitness section aisle of, you know, athletic training or training like an athlete, like you said, is the relativity to body weight. Because when you look at, you know, at the end of the day, like what is the, what is the resistance we're constantly, you know, interacting with, um, you know, at an exponential level, it's going to be body weight, right? Like depending on gait, depending on, like you said, velocity, the massive thing that changes is how much of my body weight exponentially I am now working with, you know, from one times my body weight to 5.8 times my body weight if I'm Usain Bolt in his first four strides, right? And if you have an athlete, like you said, with varying levels of strength, the athlete that has an inability to manage for, you know, one and a half to even two times their body weight is going to really struggle when they start to try to put force back into the ground when it's giving them back, you know, in the tens of times their own body weight. Yeah, because this is where, you know, you made a really good point the other day. I've been thinking about it ever since about GPP because it's like G general physical preparedness. Now I, I like it as an overarching principle. I hate it in application because you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's like, well, it's not really general, is it? Because GPP, because let's, let's kind of play this out along a timeline, right? Or like a, a horizons of ability. If you have someone, and, and I usually, it's funny, I always have to move the goalpost to make it relatable to the trainer from a more comprehension standpoint, because they can't move. So it's like, imagine you, know, you have a client who's doing like body weight squats are a little bit over. And it's like, okay, technique is breaking down with this client at a, I don't know, a 10 pound goblet squat at the second set of eight reps. What is the relative load that you would have to have on your back for you to break down? So what is your, what is your two by eight rep max? Or, I don't know. i say it's 300 pounds. And, you know, that's fairly light for people that we interact with. I was like, okay, so take the 10 pound weight from her. What are you left with? You no know, body weight. Okay. Uh, so what is 10 pounds relative to that person as a percentage? Oh, okay. So you remove... Uh, a percentage of their body weight to let's just say, I don't know, you remove 5% of their body weight from the thing. Okay. What if you remove 5% of the 300 pounds? What are you left with? Uh, like two, I don't know what I have, 260 or 285 or whatever. And I'll go, okay. Imagine walking around every day of your life with 285 pounds on your back and then getting to the gym and adding 5%. Do you get it now? Do you get how this is different, right? Especially when we start to deal with exercises that like we talked about are, are, are more, reliant on absorbing, producing, and transferring force, changing direction, changing planes of motion, right? Changing tissues that are loaded, turning muscles on, turning muscles off, right? Like, uh, like you, I, you indicated that real you know, rhythm and timing and cadence were big parts of athleticism. It's like, there's no cadence when you're in this hypervigilant state. You, we, we did a podcast years ago and you talked about, you know, vigilance and its process in inhibiting skill acquisition, right? It's like yeah. the, 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 you're, like you're hyper sympathetic in a sense where you walk around all day with 280 pounds on your back and then you got into the gym and someone just added 5% or 10% more. It's like, 
you're not an inability to learn. You're definitely not an ability to absorb with tissue, but you're probably going to be absorbing force with the nerve passive soft tissues. That's why people's yeah. knee hurts when they do fucking squat because they've been walking around with 85% or 90% of their fucking one rep max or eight rep max. And you just added 10% and added velocity to it. It's like, dude, so the, this is where I think, you know, we, we've discussed in private and public about the, the idea of physical empathy. It's like relative strength is one of the, like, I would say relative strength is as important as understanding the concept of center of mass. If we're talking like biblical shit, you know, I'm the burning bush, you're up Moses, the reds, we're reading the commandments. It's like, yo, fitness training commandments, you know, whatever, you're, put your weights away. Sure. That comes later. First thing, yeah. understand, like understand relative strength, understand center of mass, and you're probably going to be, because people don't understand it, right? Because then taking someone and doing a box jump, that would be like, hey, Killian, uh, 275 on the bar. I want you to jump to a 14-inch box. Like, are you yeah. nuts? And, and, you know, I, I think the, the point there, like for people to, to take with them, right, is, you know, the whether it be the exercises we choose or the load on the bar going back to that point, like speed has to be fast. Like velocity has to have a relative speed, you know, and, and strength has to have a relative, you know, external load or internal load that we're battling with. You know, there, there is to some degree this idea that, you know, I don't think people need to squat two times their body weight to be able to do, you know, plyometric exercises, but it's an understanding that like the true definition of training, like an athlete is understanding the intent of the task that you're giving to that person, right? Is the intent of the task moving quickly and producing force? Is the intent of the task moving slowly and absorbing force? Is the intent of the task transferring those forces? And I think that's where we get lost with exercise selection is we have things like speed squats. And it's like, well, that's an exercise of strength. It's not an exercise of velocity. The exercise itself starts with an, like an, a, a eccentric phase exponential to that of its concentric phase. Like the exercise itself is engineered to be stronger than it is to be faster. A deadlift is engineered to be faster than it is to be conventionally stronger on that strength curve. So to truly be an athlete, I think is to understand, you know, your exercise selection comes down to intention and training like an athlete is to have a definitive intent to your training session. There are exercises that aren't available to people because like you said, they don't have the relative building blocks to get there. You know, Sally's box jump is not an exercise of velocity. Sally's box jump is jumping out of a plane. You know what I mean? She's just hoping she gets <laughs> the shit out of her shins. You know, there'll never be the result you're looking for from that. Cause she'll be never be living on the curve where that is something that needs to happen. It's so funny. There's two things I want to touch on. One is intentionality because I see intentionality driven so hard in common resistance training to build muscle and hyper and like, you know, the general hypertrophy stimulus where it's like, eh, kind of based off what we know about muscle growth, intentionality might actually be counterproductive to muscle growth, right? The idea yeah. of like squeezing something really hard is like, I don't know if that's really going to be stimulating. It might actually be fatiguing and limiting our ability to stimulate. And then when you see people go down the athletic route, they're just chucking it. Like, you're a chucker. Sorry, bro. I don't know how yeah. to break it to you and your neon laces that match the fucking laces on your shorts, but you got the gray underneath. I see what you did. You're trying to balance the room, but it ain't it, dog. It ain't it. Your fucking med ball slams ain't it. Your fucking outfit's not it. Your goddamn spiky tips, definitely not it. Your purpose, you, you bought a cutoff shirt. No, you buy a shirt with sleeves, and then over time, you cut the sleeves off. That's how cutoffs work. You can buy a tank top, right? You can buy something that is manufactured to be a little bit, you know, you got a bit of trap going on, you got a bit of upper pec. You can buy that as an article of clothing. You cannot buy sleeveless t-shirts. Some dry fit joint with the, no, wrong, wrong answer. Anyways, but the idea is that guy is a chucker when he's doing athletic things, pushing a sled, rope, battle ropes, Jesus Christ, med ball, whatever the fucks, no intentionality, just a chucker. And all of a sudden, he's a first chair violinist when he sits in on a bicep curl. Like, yo, like you, you take Mozart's for put flip those. You want to be a chucker? Do it on a fucking Smith machine. Be a chucker on a Smith machine. You know what? If you get violent enough when you're lifting weights in relatively safe settings, your muscles are going to grow. It, uh, yeah. Squeeze, don't give a fuck. Just move. Honestly, you want to just bend 10, go for it. 
intentionality exists over here, right? But it's understanding, it's understanding adaptations in different subcategories that most people aren't used to. Like understanding that, look, you know, it, it, speed or rhythm, like qualitative, in some cases, immeasurable subjective things are what we're chasing. And then, but moving the intentionality to the things that are like, oh, this is meant to actually uh, decelerate. My, my focus isn't to do this as fast as possible or to do this in the shortest amount of time or to get there. Or it's about whatever the skill is that you're trying to practice. So I think most people don't have a working lexicon of adaptation. They don't know what are trainable attributes other than just shocking it. Yeah. And, and I think the unfortunate thing is, you know, I feel like I reference and, and you and I have referenced the force velocity curve a lot. And it's not that I assume that no one knows what it is, but I almost assume to some degree, no one knows how to use it. That, you know, like it's a graph, but like we could actually use it as a tool to begin to plot not only where an athlete lives in their sport and how we can better help them do the thing they do, but also where exercises might live better as well. Right. And it's that same idea. Like the guy, you know, with neon tights under his gray shorts at the gym is like, he's the guy speed squad, right? He's got half the idea. He's like, well, I wear the tights. Now I'm an athlete. I move quickly. Now I'm improving my speed, but it's like the joint angles don't match how we produce speed. The rate of force development doesn't match how you produce speed. The fact that the movement exists from eccentric to concentric doesn't match producing speed. And it's like living on this graph is really easy to take literally any exercise you have and just go, well, that lives over here. This lives over here. Like a deadlift is always going to be a, a power exercise. It goes from max velocity in your warm up to peak power at its failure. It never fails in its eccentric quality. By the time a deadlift becomes eccentric, it's over. The meat is over for everyone when it becomes eccentric. A squat starts there. It's never, ever going to be max velocity because it's hindered by the fact that you took a max eccentric and then tried to fight your way up in the second half of the movement. You know, and I think that's where I see a big, you know, counterpoint in, in people's training like an athlete is they take every movement and they apply what you spoke about velocity to it. And they go, well, training like an athlete means I don't have to be maximally strong. I just need to move quick. So I'm just going to push the shit out of the sled. I'm going to slam a medicine ball in a direction I never want an athlete to go. I kind of always want athletes going this way, but I'm going to take an exercise and have them go closer to the ground a lot. And I think it's just, you know, taking movements and then applying what we believe athletics is moving quickly to any and all movements where it's like, we could do this quickly and simply by taking the graph, taking the exercises and going, where does this exercise win? Where does it fail? Does it fit in an athletic program or, or, or does it not? Yeah. And I think uh, there's two things I wanted to touch on there. Fuck. What was the first one? The idea of force velocity curve being like the sports resistance profile strength curve, yeah. right? Like everyone's just, just blowing their nut over understanding, which is like, yeah, sure. You know, there seems to be some understand, like some benefit from a hypertrophy standpoint. If you can understand how to manipulate a strength curve, in across a resistance profile, it's more specifically in the length and position as we've sort of like, you know, surmised from many years of just watching people do shit that worked and it happened to be in the length and position. But it's like, yeah, that's useful to understand like the physical properties of resistance and tension across a muscle in its position relative to the direction and magnitude of the load. Absolutely. This is the sports version of that. Yeah. So it's like, if you know resistance profiles and strength curves, Okay, you're in the ballpark for you know general the bodybuilding whatever resistant training bro split stuff. But if you don't know the you know if you don't know the force velocity curve, it's the same guiding principle that's going to help us make decisions, right? Ultimately, the way we look at the the resistance profile and the strength curve, the length tension relationship of muscles, if you will, is it's a it's a tool to help us manage load. You know, yeah. We still stimulate, but we base our, the magnitude of load off of the position and the loadability in that position. And there are nuances to lengthen the mid range and shorten that, you know, uh, honestly, maybe matter, maybe don't, but at large, that principle holds true across the curve, across the board, across the graph. Resistance training uses that speed development, strength and, and force and velocity. Those the relate the intersection of relationship there. You need to understand if you are worrying about muscles in isolation, you need to understand that muscles length tension. If you're worried about, you know, creating force and velocity, 
you might want to pay attention to the graph that's literally called the title of the thing that you want to learn that you need to pay attention to. That was the one thing I brought up that, that I think is a useful parallel for people to walk away with. And the second one is getting back to the idea of GPP. It's about understanding like, well, look, how does this GPP is often accepted as just bad bodybuilding for athletes. That's usually what yeah. GPP is, yeah. which is like a GPP for a, G, a general population person is also just bad bodybuilding for someone who's not an athlete. But it's like, there is such a clear divide if we think about well, what is this athlete's relationship to stress? What is this athlete's relationship to their body weight and their own strength? Because a GPP for a general population person, yeah, it might look something like bad bodybuilding, right? It might look like something that's trying to improve the, just the base, level, the, the base level strength to body weight ratio so that we can start to land some of these exercises on parts of the curve where the exercise is going to win. Right. Yeah. Because like, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a seated to standing broad jump. It's like you do. If you do that with like an elderly person, that's literally a test of their mortality. Yeah. Literally, there's a test. It's like, OK, getting up out of a chair, and like walking five feet in a certain number of seconds is like a pretty strong predictor of all cause mortality. And if so, if you're sitting on a box at, you know, hip height and. Uh, or sorry, at knee height, and you kind of do this reactive broad jump or reactive vertical jump, where you're taking out some of that, uh, that, uh, that elastic eccentric phase and really focusing on the concentric. And, and, you know, that's going to be a con completely different experience to your relative strength of body. Why? Because the homeboy had been GPP in it since he was swinging hammer back in a construction job, like fucking seven years ago, right? When he was 140 pound pushing a sled, living in a bathtub in Vancouver. Like we done the GPP, right? The thing is you don't need to do the GPP anymore. You train with me and we do like bad bodybuilding, which is like my life, <laughs> just yeah. really bad bodybuilding, broken old man, bad bodybuilding. I'm just shy of showing up with sponges or fucking gardening gloves to the gym now. Yeah. Shout out Windsor. That's common. And you know, it's a, it's a different experience where, you know, Sally, what's her bucket? Probably GPP is going to be like, hey, let's just get relative strength to body weight ratio. So when we start landing some of these exercises, no pun intended, we actually are putting them in a place where they're meant to win, right? Because I can sit and try and jam a, you know, a reactive broad jump into a Sally side. It's not going to fucking work. It's not going to work. She's about, she's about eight plates on a leg press away from this being the thing that we need it to be. So GPP is like, well, it's preparedness. That's the yeah. key. So in order to be prepared for something, it's you need to know where the starting position is, right? It's not like everyone starts at the same point and just goes through the same thing. So GPP is as bastardized as athletic training because there's no logic or, or, or pretense to where we're assessing people's starting point from. We're just like, okay, it goes bad bodybuilding into faster bad bodybuilding. Like, is that, that's usually how it goes. So yeah, GPP, the specificity is it and it's something that like you know we talk about in hypertrophy we talk about in rehabilitation it's it's not about novelty it's about specific variability this yeah. will introduce new variations of movements it will introduce new tempos it'll introduce you know potentially novel ranges of motion as they are new to you but their adaptation or their stimulus is specifically chosen it's not just grabbing out of a hat and like no so novelty i think is something that people you know, our brain likes new things. You know, the learning process is, it's very stimulatory to the, to the brain and body, but we need to learn the things that we need to learn, right? Like, you know, if I'm going to Japan and I start learning, I don't know, Cantonese, it's like, wow, that's impressive. You're still going to get fucking lost, right? So yeah. it's like the idea of novelty being secondary to specific variability, you need to understand the variables that we can specifically impose a demand on and make adaptation. And that's where the whole enterprise is built on. And that fundamental information is just not permeating through the skulls of coaches that try and coach people like athletes. Yeah, I, I think like, like you said, like the whole thing that goes back to like GPP, you know, not it's just it's just it's just not general, you know, like, you know, there is a specific adaptation that Sally needs to incur relative strength, right? She needs to be relatively more strong because GPP is GPP is the general qualities of an athlete specifically prepared. Like if I were to do GPP with an athlete guy going to the NFL, we're specifically doing strength the way specific strength training protocols exist. We're specifically doing speed. 
We're specifically doing endurance. You work with a massive population of NFL players. They don't just do general speed. You go to the track or you go to the field and you do legit track and field training to make a guy faster because speed is a general quality prepared specifically. And, and I think that's where people get lost. Sally doesn't get to do speed or endurance because she doesn't have the strength to move quickly for any amount of time. So who cares how long she moves really slow, right? And that's kind of how the building blocks go together. Like no one gives a shit that it took you eight hours to run a marathon and your knees hurt because you weren't strong enough to run it in four hours at a pace that all your friends would actually show up and give you flowers at the end. So I think when we look at general physical preparedness, there is a relative strength component. And then it's like, well, now that we're relatively strong, can we move that weight with any level of intentionality, concentrically and eccentrically? And then if so, can we move it for long enough that we can incur an adaptation that anyone would actually give a shit about? And that's kind of the endurance category for people. And then specifically, we can set parameters to those general capacities, like how relatively strong does someone have to be? The sport decides. How fast do they have to be? The sport decides. How long do they have to run for? The sport decides. Elliot Kipchoge and, you know, uh, Fred Curley don't need to be able to at, run as fast as one another for as long because Curley's never going to run a marathon and Kipchoge's never going to line up on the hundred. But they both need to have a relative speed to endurance ratio that's built through the durability of strength. Kipchoge still kind of has to be strong. He can't melt, you know, and, and Curley has to be really fucking strong because he's three inches taller than the next fastest guy in the hundred. And he has to kind of not pop up at the start, you know? So I think it's general physical preparedness or general qualities prepared specifically. Yeah. And I think when we get into uh, being a superlative at an adaptation, you start to realize that, look, I would assume that Kip Joge has to do a lot of strength training in the off season just to keep the fucking chassis together. Yeah. Right. The, just from a bone density perspective alone, like yeah. homeboy's knocking out 26 consecutive four minute, 36 second miles. It's yeah. like, you need a fucking, you need a chassis that's not going to bend at that, at that level of stress. Now there are other benefits because if you took, if you took a, a, a miler who might run endurance or tempo runs, he's going to run more than a mile, right? It's almost like a batter yeah. singing in the batter's box, swinging three bats or someone doing some sort of purposeful overload of you know holding a bench press iso for you know, x 10 seconds or whatever more yeah. than what they can actually load it's like dude kipchoge's mile is a competitive mile when he runs 26 of them really Propped up off of it right it's insane like four. i mean thinking about the roger yeah. bannister marker of like the four minute mile it's like okay imagine if kipchoge let loose and just took the gas now, mind you, he's running off a different, you know, he's running off a different fuel source, quite literally. He's not running off rocket yeah. fuel like Curly. He's not running off rocket fuel like a soft of Powell. But it's like homeboy's got 91 in there, which in Canada's, you know, he's, he's $150 to fill a tank at 91. God bless. These are tough times. But it's like, okay, he's not going to have that fucking, you know, Paul Walker live life quarter mile at a time NOS pack to hit. But he's still, he's still playing for slips. Like you got to imagine. And that's where like we that is the ubiquitous understanding of athleticism. And that's really at broad when we look at athletes at the highest level, they have propped up the, each system in itself to be world class. Right. Yeah. And it's, so it really it's a matter of like, look, we talk if you kind of follow this from the beginning and put some of the pieces together, endurance, intensity, velocity, rhythm, coordination, timing. Right. This is sort of like your roadmap that runs in somewhat of like a circuitous fashion. And we can always be, as we go through the tasks and tasks that are supporting other tasks, we can be somewhere in this infinite loop of intentionality with an exercise of like, is this something that it does it, does it win at being an endurance exercise, right? Someone, you know, uh, is ski erg versus a, uh, uh, a fan bike versus a rower. It's like, well, the highest output you know, potentially if I'm looking for some sort of metabolic or, or cardiovascular stress, I don't want my shoulder position to be the thing that really talks my ticker from turning over because I actually want to drive more blood volume into the chambers of the heart, which makes the heart stronger. So it's like I'm going fucking low skill, high out, we're going fan bike, right? Rower, right? I'm sitting there like out of Vancouver and just ripping. It's like, dude, there's a, there's too much of a skill and a timing and rhythm and component or a, a, a cadence component to rowing, right? So it's like, 
take get rid of that. So it's understanding the exercises that fit across those trainable those training trainable adaptations, right? And then it's about progressing all of them, right? And I think yeah. usually that infinite loop and people don't think about little like uh, checkpoints along this you know Le Mans racetrack and they just fucking burn the tires out and they try and just do everything fast. And it's like, well, look, you know, maybe fast is not the move for, especially not the move in a lot of cases for like rhythm and timing and cadence, right? Yeah. Now things done quickly need to have a rhythm, almost like the idea of top end strength in itself being a separate skill. You watch yeah. powerlifters fall victim to this all the time. You know, they, something as simple as, seemingly simple as a walkout for a, a powerlifter who trains too much submaximal volume, who doesn't actually get used to the environment of that heavy weight, 90% plus, all of a sudden they don't actually have the skill to squat because their setup is different, their walkout is different because they're not used to it, right? So you know that's those that crossover principle exists at high velocity. We still need rhythm and cadence. We still need a certain level of strength and endurance. We still need a little bit of intensity, but its velocity is just pulling that tensegrity model towards it with that particular exercise. So it's, it's you got to understand that, look, there are discernible stimulus. There's discernible adaptations we can make. At broad, Broadly speaking, I would put intensity uh, or endurance, intensity, velocity, rhythm, cadence, and timing can, can be somewhat interchangeable at times. They're very task dependent. But, you know, understand that like there's maybe four or five different buckets we could like chuck things into and i'd be open for a discussion for more uh but i think it's about understanding like like you said early intentionality is going to be how we discern what exercise best stimulates each one of these things and it's not just challenging muscle and it's not just challenging the clock it's about picking across like oh this is actually meant for endurance right and then as we get more specific as athletes get better you know the idea of you know, uh, uh, speed strength. That's a thing. We start to cross sure. over the, you know, if we look at Kipchoge, it's like, yeah, that dude has speed endurance, right? Yeah. He can turn over properties of high velocity for a long period of time, but it's like starting with the basis of like, look, identify the things that you can control and manipulate, understand the tools that you're using to do that. And then have an intention when you're using that tool to build up that aspect of your client's athleticism. But it's, you know, it's the, the neon pants and the gray Under Armour sweat or however that wardrobe has played out over the last hour is like it's just turns into a muddled grab bag. And it's so funny because it's not funny, but I, I find it funny. I was in the gym earlier today with a friend of mine who's like relatively new to the gym. And we're kind of looking around and he's like, dude, how much of this could be done better? And I was like. Well, better is tough, right? Because it's small hinges open big doors. And I think there's every single person in here from a technical perspective, we could probably manipulate and drive adaptation quicker. And it is wild when you start to, when you start to, you know, and the combine, the level three and, and having a competition date in athletics, I think is something that is really uh, a useful uh, and especially when that's taken away, I think a lot of the utility in athletic training goes away as you kind of talked about the idea of like, look, the outcome is very nebulous. The goal is very nebulous. But if you can start to discern the, the specifics of every exercise and the intention behind every exercise and the desired adaptation of every exercise, dude, you can make you can make progress so fucking quickly it's insane yeah. man you picked up running and then like within like hey two months yo bro i just ran off like a four seven forty and i was like yeah. what Dude, weren't you doing like box jumps like last week like what like, did you i don't what, what do we mean but it's like it's if you can understand it's the same with physique adaptation right like we have we have trainers and coaches that work with us in the physique adaptation space like james mcintosh is obviously you know he's he's our guy when it comes to that and contest prep but if you can understand like, oh, resistance profile, strength curves, nutrition, nutrition, uh, nutrient timing, supplementation, you know, interaction, synergistic effects, sleep science, and all that. It's like, dude, it doesn't take that long. And it, I would argue at the very least, the ability to get a client to their to start pushing their potential. If you can understand these principles and apply these principles effectively, it's like taking a like a. It's like taking a giant plane on a runway to sample your runway progression idea just a little bit. But then it's like, okay, what if you're fucking, what if you don't have a runway anymore? That's, I don't know, to, to 20,000 feet. What if your runway is 
300 feet and you're on the fucking SS Minnow Johnson or whatever in the middle of the fucking ocean and you got to get the spider jet. What if you got eight weeks? We got eight weeks to get this guy ready. It's like, oh shit. Now I'm actually going to go into the weeds and I'm going to look at the specifics and discern the intentionality. And all of a sudden, guess what? In eight weeks, you got someone. It's like, well, if you have that constraint of time, you should always have the urgency to discern the stimulus you're trying to evoke and the adaptation you're trying to get your body to respond to. But it's, you got to understand the base principles. You also have to understand the starting point of the athlete you're working with. Yeah. And, and I think that's where, like, you know, we talked about force velocity in, in this podcast. We've talked about general physical preparedness being speed, strength, endurance. We've talked about the ability to absorb, transfer, produce. And, like, these are all things for, for coaches, for trainers, for people with, like that they want to do it with themselves. Like you said, it's like giving yourself a very distinct timeline is incredibly important because it allows you to start making these kind of like Air Force One decisions where you're like, well, where is the hole in the plot? You know what I mean? Like, oh, Gary Oldman was the waiter. And it's like, well, fuck, that's why Harrison Ford's the president. So I think it's like with even like you reference myself, like, you know, I started jumping in the basement of this old folks home and I started sprinting. What I was able to do was go through GPP and I was like, all right, well, do I have the preparedness to do a track and field meet at 31 years old after not doing track since high school? Am I relatively strong? Yes, I am. In comparison to what you need to be strength wise to sprint, pretty fucking strong in a lineup of sprinters. So I was like, why am I wasting sessions on getting strong? I need to take now take the relative strong I strength I have. I need to take that strength and put it on the force velocity curve and go, is the strength I have, like you said, with a powerlifter who trains too submaximally, am I able to express the quality of strength along the force velocity curve in a way that benefits my running? No, because I lift really fucking slow. So I was like, okay, well now training above 80 doesn't serve me anymore in my training. I can take the same movements, but now I need to understand how they fit on the force velocity curve. I stopped squatting so much. There's nothing wrong with squatting, but squatting was this eccentrically dominant force absorption to transfer side of the curve. And I was like, well, I don't need that. I can yield to a shit ton of force. I can't produce anything. So I went into the other side. I went to concentric dominant movements, deadlifts, broad jumps, not even really box jumps at first. I just looked at things that benefit this concentric side and this ability to produce force, get on the other side of my feet. Um, and then endurance. Dude, did I have the ability to run 100 meters? No. The first time I tried to run 100, I got like 60 meters in. I was like, Jesus Christ, how far is it again? And it beat the shit out of me. I was like, well, I need endurance. And I broke my toe. And the thing I always reference to people is where I saw the immediate difference in my performance on the track was, like you had mentioned, dude, the Airdyne bike, the assault bike. I hit 100 calories as fast as I could every day on the assault bike. My performance at the track increased tremendously. It had nothing to do with running. It was simply building the endurance engine that I needed to fit all the speed work into because I had the strength to put force into the track, but after 15 meters, it didn't go anywhere. So, you know, being able to, to audit somebody and go, we have the relative strength. Why are we fucking around with strength still? We have, maybe you even have the relative endurance. And it's like, well, why am I gassing my athlete out on the assault bike? I don't need to. And it's like, maybe we just need to work at velo. Then why are we even running 60 meters? Like this guy just needs 10s, 20s, 30s, needs to put a sled behind him, work on speed strength, and we're out the door. So I think being able to break down performance into like what we said, speed, strength, endurance, absorption, transfer, production, center of mass, and then velocity versus max strength, eccentric versus concentric qualities. And if you as a coach can, can use those filters, like we've said before, to find your Airbnb, you probably won't end up in Brixton with Chubby like I did. Blast story in itself. And I think, look, there's a lot of parallels to the type of filtering criteria we use in hypertrophy. It's just people need to update, like, you know, we use the Airbnb analogy of, you know, using specific criteria fields to narrow our searches and narrow our exercises. Right. Like geolocation is such a big one. Right. Because you don't want to end up on a, end up, end up with bricks and chubby. And, you know, God forbid, hopefully no one got stabbed that weekend, uh, which is not something we could say every weekend. But when we look at uh, when we look at uh, athletics, as we commonly refer to it as it's as if you go from, you know, searching for an Airbnb with certain criteria to um I don't know, maybe maybe putting together a, a, a vehicle on the internet or, or navigating Instacart. It's like, okay, there, there's, there's, a different, there's a different interface here, right? We're dealing with different variables. A lot of people are trying to like order on Instacart and it's like, 
Uh, I'd like to have Wi-Fi. It's like, no, no, no. This is where you get your groceries. It's like yeah. uh, air conditioning. What about free? What about parking on site? Laundry on site? It's like, no, like we sell bananas, sir. Like this is the wrong place for that. But they just, you know, it's hard to break the user interface of hypertrophy because it's where a lot of us come up in. So even from a language perspective, like if you're looking to get into athletics, if you're looking to be in a weight room, if you're looking to, you know, whether collegiate or pro or private or, or even have your clients have a meaningful response to the type of training so that they can prepare for whatever it is they prepare for you need to start with the language or you need to start with the user interface of the application that you're dealing with. Like, you know, and some of the terms we kind of race through them quick, you know, we have a familiarity in both theory and application of these terms, but I would start there. Like if anyone was taking the level one, the first thing we do is we talk about language, right? Language is huge. Your, your nomenclature, your vernacular, your Rolodex, your lexicon, well, the words you you speak to your clients and as those translate into exercise that you choose for your clients, intentionality is lost if you don't understand the actual, what the fucking words mean, right? Like if I were to, you know, if I were to try and read Shakespeare in iambic pentameter and emphasize and act out, you know, a play, it's like, well, if I don't understand ye ought not therefore else thou shall whatever, it's like, well, how can I add intention or emotion to that if I don't actually understand what the words mean? It's the same thing. Starts with language. So it's like get read, get fed. And it's like, I think hopefully if you got lost at any point in this, write the word down that you don't understand, right? Go to YouTube, look it up. Go to fucking, you know, uh, go to chat GPT, have it explain it to you. Google search it again, send us a voice note or whatever. And then you can go through and be like, oh, okay, now you're at a building block as a coach to really understand what does this look like at the end goal when we've stimulated, respond, and adapt at the level of the client? What is it that we're actually trying to do? Because I think so many people just don't even understand some of the base level nomenclature, and that's where you start. I think language is super important, uh, and I think hopefully, uh, you know, between Kelly and I, we've done a half decent job at laying out the landscape of it. And you know, I think it's honestly, I think with the way the industry is going, and I've thought this for some time, and I know you're the same, is that this is going to be where we end up. This is not going anywhere, right? Understanding these properties when it comes to people's desire. To, people, don't, people don't want to be bodybuilders. Why? Because bodybuilders die, right? And we, want, we people want to be able to pick up their kids, play softball, do all this stuff. And it's like, well, dude, like, you know, you can fucking hit a couple of dingers if you pay attention to these couple of things. So anyways, any closing remarks, training like an athlete, Killian Hamilton, anything before we sign off for the day? Look up the language. Like you said, I would reiterate that, man. I think the language is the best play to, place to start. And uh, yeah, man, I think, you know, you and I are doing our own part here. Hopefully people enjoy this podcast and, uh, you know, they can keep reaching out to, you know, yourself and I to hopefully glean more in this direction as I think this will be where people find themselves soon. And if you're not in the industry yet and you're getting in the industry, this is where people are going to assume you are in a few years. And this is where you'll find us. So we have obviously have level one, level two, uh, applied to anatomy, biomechanics courses online. But level three is coming out to Florida with me and Killian, uh, cutting your teeth in real life with this type of training, because it is, we think, the applied skills that are most telling of someone that has a comprehension and depth of application of that comprehension when it comes to you know training a human body. It's, it's relatively easy to train a human body to uh, you lose body fat or gain strength. But some of these other things, the discernment is a word that we keep coming back to in discerning a starting point, understanding an accurate assessment, how to deploy it, how to, in, how to infer it, and then how to apply off the back ends of that. That's, that's, the, that's the high stakes proving ground. So level three runs twice a year. We're going to run it back in, in January, February, and then we're going to run it back again in uh, June, two weeks consecutively in June. So if you're in the level two program, uh, you'll be able to apply for June in uh, early spring. And um, if you guys are not in the level one, you can get into level one, level two, and then join us in the new year, 2025. Um, so without any further ado, Killian, dude, always a pleasure. We're going to make this a habit. We'll run this back in person uh, in the near future. Uh, and guys, appreciate your time. We'll see you in the next episode.